an ex-seminarian turned ADB economist and longtime University of the Philippines professor, is the country's next socio-economic planning secretary and NEDA director general. Good evening, I'm Tony Abad and this is Political Capital. Our special guest for tonight, the Honorable Ernesto Del Mar Pernia. Good evening, Secretary Ernie. Good evening, Tony. Your background seems to make you an unlikely or not maybe a, a, an unexpected Duterte supporter. I mean, uh, people didn't, probably didn't uh, put, the, you know, put the two of you together. How did you end up in this administration? Well, in a way, uh, well, I'm an impatient person. Okay. And, uh, and so among, is he. Yeah. <laughs> among the candidates, uh, I see him as impatient and uh, he acts uh, speedily and efficiently. The uh, president that gets things done quick mm -hmm. because that has been our Waterloo, I think. Yeah, in the, in the country in terms of economic progress. No, as a people, we are forbearing, okay. patient, and, uh, you know, we, we are forgiving too yes. of our government officials, and, uh, which is not good because uh, that's what I call uh, vicious patience. What we need is virtuous impatience <laughs> because virtuous okay. impatience uh, uh, Gets, out, gets us out of uh, poverty and mm -hmm. inequality and uh, our economic and social malaise. Yeah. But the last administration, it seems that people were, were very vocal about their impatience but had no effect on the, seemed to have no effect on yeah. the government. Well, oh. sometimes uh, we show impatience but we do not sustain it. It results in mediocrity okay. in terms of output of infrastructure, you know, projects. And uh, in, in general, uh, the output of uh, government uh, policies and programs. So we're looking forward to a uh, hindi na pwede na. Yes, yeah. we, we, we need, you know, we need uh, people to push uh, and uh, be impatient about, uh, you know, the actions of uh, and the priorities of uh, politicians and uh, leadership because our problems cannot be uh, addressed by a one-pronged approach. It has to be a multi-pronged approach, you know, like uh, economic uh, progress, uh, reforms, uh, competition, yes. uh, you know, su such things. No? Now, with that mild-mannered demeanor, how do you see yourself blending in and working together with this very, uh, you know, very impulsive and very uh, strong-willed president-elect uh, of ours? In terms of his actions and uh, uh, the way he speaks, yes. I think he needs to modulate and uh, reform. <laughs> and he knows that. And he knows that. And he said that he will begin to reform when he <laughs> sits in Malacanang. Okay. Right now, he just, he's just letting out steam, I think. Right. Is he going to sit in Malacanang or is Malacanang going to Davao? No, no. He's, he's be, he will be sitting he'll in Malacanang. Sitting in Malacanang. And, uh, he will be spending maybe the weekends okay. or maybe Fridays through the weekend in Davao. In Th Davao. That is my own reading. Secretary Ernie, where did your relationship with the present elect begin, and and you know how has it progressed? Actually, over time? Uh, something like uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, my brother-in-law, uh, my sister is married to his first cousin. Okay. So, actually, very first, uh, very close first cousin, ni uh, President Duterte, President elect Duterte, because uh, you know they. Uh, my brother-in-law is the only, the only son, uh, the only child okay. uh, on, the, on, on that side the of, family, the, oh. of the relationship. And uh, I think Digong is only, uh, President-elect Duterte, there are only three of them, if I remember correctly. So it's a, it's a small family, yeah. and so they were kind of close. Well, he knew you to be an economist already. Yes, yes, because I was with the ADB at the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. I heard before that there was talk that it was Joey Salceda who was supposed to be the incoming NEDA DG. What happened? No, I, you know, as, uh, as you know, he's impulsive sometimes. Yes. And when he went to uh, Albay uh, during the campaign, yes. all of a sudden he just says that, okay, you, they were together in, the, in Congress. 
uh, when he was in Congress, when the okay. Oh, okay. Uh, both of them were in Congress. So he just, uh, you know, from the top of his head, he says, uh, "You'll be, <laughs> you'll be my uh, NEDA secretary," <laughs> so something like that. But uh, you know, I guess uh, things didn't, didn't turn out uh, favorable for Joey Salceda. Yes. Although he he loved it actually. Mm -hmm. uh, that and is, uh, th well, to thank you, to tell you frankly, I didn't even go to Davao for after the elections. Yes, I was in Davao. He invite, he asked me to go to Davao th three times during the campaign uh, to prepare him for the uh, presidential debates, and I gave him a draft of okay. the economic program already at that time. So I guess when uh, he had to make a decision, and because Joey, I think uh, you know, changed the parties. I, I just felt, uh, well, if he gives it to me, it's fine. And, you know, so <laughs> but you didn't try to get away? No, I didn't, I, I didn't try, try to get away because, in a way, I, my, my, I, was, I was predisposed already. Yes. Because, you know, of my interaction with yes. him during the campaign. So, actually, it was just through Viber messages that mm -hmm. I... So, Bongo, uh, Viber, uh, tec Viber texts me. Mm -hmm. No, no, he calls me. He called me, I think uh, it was May 16, okay. that was after elections already. Uh, he, call, uh, he called me, and the, but then I was already asleep. Uh, he called me about 10 o'clock. I was asleep because I was tired that day. So I saw a Viber message the following day asking me, uh, would you like to be uh, in the cabinet as NEDA secretary? So I just uh, answered in one word, uh, yes, because as I've said, I, I was yes. predisposed. Yeah. And so, so your, your interview he, and, yes. and appointment then, were vi via vi Viber. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And then May 22, he had a late uh, press conference, remember? Yes. And he made the announcement. Now, the cabinet composition, you know, the, this, this new official family of yours, is it's quite diverse. No? In fact, it's, a, it's like a rainbow coalition. Uh, the political spectrum coming in from the, the extreme left all the way to the right. No? Um, how do you see all of this coming together and uh, blending together? Well, uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, my, uh, my view, though, is that uh, those on the uh, right of center and, you know, uh, more liberal or even middle of the roader yes. uh, type of uh, cabinet members uh, I, we're in the majority there are only about two or three okay uh, you know so, so on the left. you could say they're the outliers yeah mm -hmm. outliers mm -hmm. they're kind of outliers and, and actually no and i i think uh, they were told by the president that they have to agree to the program of government yes so they have to agree to the 10 point agenda right for example and agree to work with let's say retired generals yes and, uh, and mainstream, I guess, conservatives. Yeah, yeah. Right. When we come back, the 10-point economic agenda of the Duterte government. Stay with us. When I interviewed um, Secretary Sani Dominguez, um, back then we were talking about a nine-point agenda which I understand has now grown to uh, a 10-point agenda from the original 8-point agenda. Could you elaborate on um, the additional point number 9 first? That's about, the, uh, about reproductive health. Yeah, well, it's really, uh, it's a law, you yes. know, a responsible parenthood and reproductive health law. Uh, so it should be implemented. Yes. Uh, the problem is that uh, you know, there have been uh, petitions against uh, certain provisions of the law uh, brought up to the Supreme Court. So there's a TRO mm -hmm. on uh, a certain contraceptive, so-called implanon, mm -hmm. which is a subdermal, you know, thing on the arm of uh, women who want it. And it is the most effective because it's good for three years. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to worry about forgetting, you know, yes. the, the regime or, or the uh, taking of pills, the regime of taking, taking pills, which is uh, kind yeah. of elusive, you know, sometimes for women especially. Mm -hmm. Those are busy, poor, and less educated. But the anti-RH group is yes. 
against this because it, it acts it, as a it, 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 it ar They argue that it's uh, abortive fashion. Th th that petition was uh, brought up to the Supreme Court in August last year. Until now, you know, the Supreme Court hasn't acted. So this is this is the kind of uh, impatience that I yeah. have, you know, because but in I the don't meantime, know why does it, why does, it, why does, it does it hold the law or yeah they can uh, government uh, cannot act. The DOH cannot but the TRO is in effect in effect mm. yeah when you're talking about this impatience of for example the Supreme Court and, and this action on, on the RH law it's not not just inaction I think there's really a deliberate action to sort of intimidate and 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 scare everybody into maintaining the status quo and how do you see this new government now actually coming you know uh, coming to terms with this uh, long I guess centuries old intimidation yes it's uh, it's really uh, the tyranny of a small minority yes. this uh, so-called pro-life groups you know uh, supported by the Catholic Church hierarchy yes President-elect Duterte said that we have to address this uh, issuance, easy issuance, yes. issuances of TROs. And uh, we need to minimize TROs, especially projects that have to do with, uh, that have to do with economic uh, development, economic progress, yes. poverty reduction, you know. Now, and following this, uh, I guess this idea that one religion yeah. uh, is imposing its doctrine by way of legislation no, into the republic's, uh, I guess, supposedly secular laws. No? Does that mean that we'll also be seeing in the, I guess, if this is successful, um, changes in certain laws like uh, divorce uh, and anything else that's been imposed by, by the Roman Catholic Church on, on Philippines, the Philippine government? Yeah. Now, I think, uh, well, there are uh, certain uh, members of Congress that are thinking of, you know, uh, the, the next move would be to, about divorce. Yes. Yeah. Because again, that is anti-poor. Yes. Yeah, because right. it's the poor who cannot afford to, you know, to go to, through an yeah, to the, or to the process, yeah. expensive process. And yeah. they just have to uh, stick it out. Yeah. And I think and it's only green and bare. Uh, the Philippines and the Vatican are the yeah, only countries that's left. Right. That's, right. <laughs> that's right. With no divorce. Yeah. Though. And what about the tenth point, this new additional point, which has to do with science and technology? The tenth point is uh, what we have been advocating at UP. Yes. We need to promote uh, more aggressively, uh, more, more strongly, uh, the promotion of science and technology and creative arts. Okay. Creative arts are important because... It's about, it's about creative, yeah. creativity. You know? Yeah, crea yes. creativity. And this is really just to enhance, to strengthen our innovative and creative capacities. We're only spending 0.15%, uh, 15% of 1% of yes. GDP for science and technology. Yes. So, so we, we, because of that, we have been lagging behind our Asian neighbors. Our Asian neighbors are spending at least 1%. The future of the world is really knowledge economy. Yes. We, we got to prepare for the knowledge economy. And maybe the problem is that we've been a sort of this protectionist, closed economy all this time, and sort of kept the Philippine, the younger Filipinos from really. So, is it going to tie in also with all of these? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, we need to liberalize reform. our education system. You okay. know, we are on one. We're I think one of the few ca Asian countries who still don't have foreign universities located here in yes. our in our shores. No. We need that. Yeah. I mean, China, they have a uh, foreign university. And, and international faculty. International faculty, international students. Okay. We need to open up. To now, them. among the 10 points of the 10 point agenda, what would you describe as the, the top three? The, the, the top three that you are going to work on when you hit the ground running um, uh, come July 1? Well, uh, of course, we need to maintain. Uh, our economic fundamentals. Mm -hmm. uh, the current administration has been has done a good job in uh, through sound monetary and fiscal policies. Mm -hmm. We have maintained uh, good macroeconomic fundamentals. So you see a continuation of yeah, the same need, yeah. fiscal and monetary that's policies. Yeah. No. But that's a, at the macro level. Right. In terms of uh, the subnational economies, they are not sound. I mean, uh, and that's because uh, uh, development economic development has been yeah. concentrated in Metro Manila. That's right. Centralized, too centralized, too concentrated. And the, the 
benefiting uh, regions would just be around Metro Manila. So what are your other top points? Uh, well, top well of, of course, uh, yeah, uh, attracting uh, foreign direct investment. Oh, okay. And uh, which means we have uh, which to means uh, easing constitutional restrictions okay. on foreign direct investment. So constitutional reform will definitely include this removal of the, the restrictions on investment. Okay. There are some laws, I think, that are also been quite uh, restrictive, like retail trade, mm -hmm. for example. Yes, yes. Uh, we should open up the, open, open that up. up also. Are we expecting to apply for TPP membership? Uh, uh, I mean, I, under the this admi new I, administration. I think, uh, given the his uh, favorable attitude toward easing restrictions, uh, I, th I think he will agree to you know joining TPP, okay. and we would, I would, uh, you know, recommend <laughs> joining TPP. Now, Secretary uh, Dominguez also mentioned as one of the top priorities tax reform. Yes, tax reform. Yes, yes. that's right. That's another one. So tax reform. Uh, yeah, he, that's his. Uh, so he said that we, you know, we would try to and correct me if I'm wrong. Try to meet with the standard, which is actually a lower. That's right. Uh, corporate income tax and, and uh, also and personal income personal tax. Income tax. Yeah. Sort of re, re rationalizing right. the whole system. Yeah. Actually, uh, and make uh, the our tax system more equitable yes. and progressive. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to ask you about agriculture because um, um, I remember years back we had been trying to deal with the whole rice policy. Yes. Some pronouncements from incoming Secretary Pinol that they're going to do all the rice importation and. What, what are they going to do with it? They're going to re-centralize the uh, rice. Centralize. Yeah, yeah. With NFA. I oh, mean. NFA. So that's uh, you know, business as usual then. Yes. Or even worse. No? no, I think that is to be rethought. After the break, a look ahead at Dutertenomics from one of its main architects. Please stay tuned. You have some important points that were raised during, uh, during the campaign. Of course, investments, which we just talked about, rural development and employment generation. Employment generation, of course. Our incoming president, has he already, I mean, at least expressed to you or have you, have you discussed with him, you know, his own thinking, his own philosophy with regard to, to these economic matters or economic issues? Well, he hasn't really explicitated uh, his, ec his uh, economic philosophy. Yes. He has told us that uh, he's going to focus on law and order okay. and uh, stamping out criminality and drugs. And uh, he will let us leave us to our own devices. In the terms economic of our managers. Res yeah, in terms of our res economic responsibility. In terms of our responsibilities, okay. respective responsibilities. Yeah. Now, when we talk about competition, no. about uh, dealing with uh, monopolies or cartels or, or an, any an other kind of anti-competitive behavior. There really is always this sort of expectation that the president will be influenced by, by certain forces that are very big uh, economically. Have you talked to him about it or do you see him being able to, to stand up you know, or uh, act independently of, of these forces? All I've heard him say so far is that uh, he wants uh, more efficient and uh, you know, lower priced and yes. uh, faster uh, connectivity. Okay. And he said if uh, our two telcos do okay. not uh, shape up, it's going to you know, okay. bring in foreign okay. competitors. Yes. So he'll buy into the concept <laughs> yeah, that it's so. actually competition that brings down I think so. prices. Yeah. So. Now, there's certain areas also like, let's say, judicial reform. We're talking about TROs and, and the like. Um, and human capital development and even values formation. Are these things that you've been thinking about as incoming uh, NEDA DG? Uh, human capital development, to him, uh, it's uh, foremost in his, uh, in his uh, hierarchy of priorities, yes. education and health. We had a list of 10 also, 10 or 11 uh, items in that draft that we gave him. We had values formation, meaning uh, essentially what, that, uh, what we had in mind was that uh, faith or religion, whatever it is, Muslim, Protestant, uh, Buddhist, Catholic, should uh, drive uh, secular morality yes. in terms of day-to-day -day conduct in the office, especially government officials. Yes. No? 
and even private sector uh, players should their 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 conduct should be driven by their faith. Otherwise, useless ang faith. Eh. Right. Faith is empty or religion is empty. It's just rich rituals, you know, in our country that we are supposed to be the only Christian, the only Catholic country yes. in Asia, but we are known to be one of the most corrupt. Uh, yes. you know? So, parang it's kind of a no, eh? contradiction. So, how do we how do we change that? Maybe, you know, maybe leadership can show the example. Expectations are very high. Yes. And so he really has to show uh, palpable results in terms of law and order and criminality and drugs. You know, the theme of the economic program, uh, the way I I titled it or we titled it uh, was and is uh, or should be poverty and inequality reducing economic growth. Inclusive growth is nice to hear, but uh, you know, inclusive of whom? Yes. So, the, the, so I th a more uh, a clearer way of expressing, you know, the, our our problem is really to reduce poverty and inequality. I would like to suggest to the PSA that instead of just reporting uh, quarterly GDP, yes, we should uh, decompose that I that GDP, that economic growth, uh, in, ter in, in terms of the increase in national of the national pie, you know. How is that distributed okay. across income yes. classes? Secretary Ernie, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll see you again you here on Bloomberg presumptuous TV. Presumptuous secretary. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Dr. Ernie Pernia is the epitome of technocracy and economic development, and now the head of a vital cog in the next administration. He knows what policies need to be implemented to address the persistent problems of poverty and inequality in the Philippines. But facing the enormous challenges of our political economy, will he be able to help the new government lead the country to a more inclusive future? This is Tony Abad for Political Capital. Thank you, and we'll see you again next week.